Tashi Dele. Uh, my warm greetings to uh, all my Dhamma friends and family. Today I thought I would share some uh, reflections on a letter of Dharma advice that uh, one of our ancestors wrote to a disciple. It's not such a long letter and the advice in it is very practical, you know, summing up all you know, the key points that we all need to focus on to cultivate the Mahayana path to full awakening. So, yeah, although it's, it was written a, a long time ago, it's still very, very relevant for all of us to, to read and reflect on, upon today. So, um, our ancestor who wrote this letter is the 14th century master Lama Tamba Sunam Yasin. He succeeded his elder brother to, um, to be Sakya Trinzin and for a time was nominal ruler of Tibet. However, everyone called him Lama Tamba, which means um, holy guru, because he was totally uninterested in politics. In fact, he was guru to the political leaders as well as the spiritual leaders of all the different traditions in Tibet, like Jena uh, Matsongkhapa, Longche Ramjamba, and many other lamas. So this was because he was an incredibly erudite scholar and an accomplished yogi. Um, all the most important teachings, all the most important practices, all of them of the Sakya tradition come through him, like the Lamdre, Vajra Yogini, Vajra Kila, and so on. Uh, so his writings are highly regarded uh, regarded for elucidating the teachings of the Sakya founding masters. In his collected works uh, is an, an anthology of letters uh, he wrote in reply to his students' uh, Dharma questions. So some short prayers and other writings. And today we're looking at the letter from this anthology that he wrote to a disciple called Demba Yasin. Uh, the letter begins with a preface uh, in the form of a homage, uh, which is the custom uh, in Buddhist writings. Here, the focus of homage is Manjushri, uh, the Bodhisattva of wis wisdom. Uh, as it says in the Namasamgiti, he is the master most powerful and prosperous in the ten levels, which means he has gone through all the, you know, the bodhisattva levels through the five paths out of great compassion, and having reached the path of no more learning, is the most senior to the eight closest uh, bodhisattva sun-like uh, disciples of the Buddha. Um, Embodying, you know, embodying all the quality, you know, all the enlightened ones, perfect, complete knowledge. So since Manjushri has all the enlightened qualities, but particularly the knowledge that understands the way things are and how they are, which we aspire to gain uh, from, you know, our studies and uh, implementation and so on. Uh, based on great compassion, then Manjushri is the perfect um, exemplar, you know, perfect exemplar to pay homage to uh, at the be beginning of uh, Jela Matamba's uh, composition and for us when studying his holy counsel. Uh, actually, we know him uh, from his uh, hydrography that Jela Matamba would always recite a prayer to Manjushri before writing anything on Dharma, uh, such as, um, you know, Palden Lodroma um, by Sakya Pandita, uh, reciting prayers focused on Manjushri like that, and Kangloma, um, 
which we explored uh, at the monastery earlier this year, can have a real impact on developing skill in um, intellect and uh, articulation. Not, not by expecting a divine being who looks like a, you know, a handsome prince to float down and blast genius into our brains by magic or something, but, you know, but by inspiring, by inspiring the development of wisdom that turns as aspiring bodhisattva into actual bodhisattvas. So in that way, every day, uh, we will become closer and closer to realizing Manjushri, the Manjushri within us. So, um, as it says in the opening verse of homage, uh, Manjushri embodies enlightened knowledge and all the other qualities. As we explored in the aspiration for success, we need the aspiring bodhicitta that wishes to attain the stage of a Buddha, you know, to attain Buddhahood for the sake of saving all sentient beings from suffering. An engaging bodhicitta, which consists of the um, six transcendent perfections, wisdom being the sixth. So the other qualities mentioned here include the the first five, which, is, which are generosity, morality, patience, joyful vigor, and dhyana. Uh, so how do we set out in developing Manjushri's qualities that we emulate? So as it says over here, having bowed to the undefiled lotus feet of Manjushri to increase one's own and others' virtues, one must listen with a respectful attitude. To the essential meaning of the victorious one's discourses condensed into an upadesha to be cherished. When one focuses on a purpose to attain personal liberation, one is practicing to develop only one's own uh, purpose with um, you know, a limited subsidiary benefit for others. When one focuses on the practices to attain total liberation, which means complete Buddhahood, then we fulfill our own and everyone else's welfare without limits, which we call the two purposes. So it's for those two purposes that we are studying this uh, teaching on the essence of Mahayana practice. Uh, the Buddha, who was victorious over every affliction and confusion, is said to have given 84,000 Dharma teachings. But here, Jelamathamba has condensed them into just a few pages of uh, essential advice. So we must relate, you know, relate to them in the right way, not just for um, intellectual curiosity, but cherishing them, you know, which means that um, taking the meaning into our hearts and practicing, practicing to gain fulfillment. So. There's an important distinction to be aware here uh, between you know, how we relate to uh, a presentation of Buddhist theory, Buddhist, you know, Buddhist theory and, or science, and how we relate to practical instructions. So although for pra practitioners, we contextualize theory or you know, an abstract presentation of Buddhist science and um, psychology for our practice. For example, um, by analyzing what appears as only, you know, as a non-evident phenomena at first, 
to then integrate in meditation so that it can be directly perceived as evident. But the way we do this is through analysis, you know, critical analysis, just as someone who isn't a practitioner could do. So this means that we are in no way expected to relate to every teacher, every uh, teaching unquestioningly, yeah, as, an, you know, as an instruction to be followed. You know, a practical Mahayana instruction is different for those who have entered the, um, you know, the Mahayana path. You know, it's, uh, it's intended for practitioners who are applying the science and psychology that we have, you know, we have analyzed. So for such teachings, it's, it's less about why, but more about, okay, how, when. So the teacher must possess a degree of learning and experience. Uh, and those receiving the teachings set the ideal mode in which um, you know, to listen to the teachings. The, th the classic analogy we use for this is a pot for you know, filling water to drink. Um, if the pot's upside down, then we can pour all the water we like, but it can never be filled. Similarly, if an instruction is being given, but you know, we're not really listening uh, because we're, uh, you know, we're wandering off internally, thinking, you know, thinking about this, that, and other things, then we're not really listening. Then we cannot absorb any benefit from it. Then, okay, turn the pot right way up and give our, you know, um, give our full attention but if the pot has holes in it, well, um, similarly, if we receive the instructions, but, you know, don't contemplate, don't contemplate the meaning, it's like the water pours in, pours in and then seeps out again. So the benefit, the benefits don't last. If the pot's right way up and intact, but there are um, undrinkable dregs in the pot, well then, if we fill it with, uh, fill it with pure spring water, it will be wasted. So likewise, if we have ulterior motives, you know, negative, um, you know, negative perceptions and so on, then it's like, you know, the content is sullied in our minds and wasted, again, wasted. So if the pot's, you know, right way up, intact and unsullied, then it will hold pure water and serve to, you know, to quench our thirst. In the same way, if we listen with fullness, you know, of energy and attention if we observe the uh, and uh, you know process the meaning through contemplation and if our motivation is genuinely altruistic and uh, faithful definitely our hearts will uh, will be you know will be sated by the dharma and everything that grows from it will be pure will be uh, you know will be wholesome so next it says, despite being unstable and having no essence, appearing as infallibly real, samsara is like a plantain tree. Due to the world thirsting for its comforts, grasping me and mind gives rise to the tribe of passion, aggression, and delusion. By pride, jealousy, and the rest of the afflictions creating non-virtuous karma. This person is tormented just like kindling wood 
by the flames, by the never-ending suffering of samsara, circling in painful existence for such a long time. So, what we call samsara is the compulsive cycle of being that has, that has highs and lows, but no matter how high it can be, is by nature compelled by our karma, is conditioned. It cannot provide unconditioned, lasting safety, lasting comfort or peace. So in that way, it's compared to a plant. A plant that bears fruit, but it's hollow. So in this way, the whole science of uh, dependent co-arising is condensed. The reflection here is not about um, you know, a merely literal interpretation of suffering, which is evident, but the broader meaning of uh, you know, what's termed dukkha, dukkha in Sanskrit. In the broader sense, Dukkha means, it means pain, suffering, uh, stress, but also dissatisfaction. That's why we also call, uh, um, you know, seeming peak moments Dukkha too. Uh, because although, of course, they feel good while they last, the fact that they don't ever last and are... Um, contingent on causes and conditions means that the bliss they, that they afford us is as though hollow. So no matter how much energy, no matter how much cleverness that we you know um, we put into trying to manipulate samsara to make us feel cozy, to make us feel comfortable and safe, and no matter how long we try to do that, no matter how long it, we seem to succeed in that, we are ultimately just kidding ourselves because we're not in control when we are compelled by karma. When we don't fully see this, when we uh, presume our perception of the real world, can't budge despite being this based on a mistaken notion of reality, we thirst, we crave for an outer happiness. And in an outer happiness and security, despite there really being no permanent happiness and security out there. So instead of looking out no, we are encouraged to stop, stop chasing, stop running, stop looking out there and look, look inside. This is because it's only inside that we can uproot the misknowing, um, the misknowing that causes physical, verbal, and mental karma that drives this wheel, this wheel of samsara on and on and on. So, um, in English, people normally say Buddhist, but in, in Tibetan language, we usually call ourselves Nangpa. Nangpa, which literally means those who look inwards. So looking inwards, looking inwards means we don't look outwards and project, um, project an internal belief onto our experiences. Like, oh, I wish it was otherwise, but oh well, you know, it's all impermanent. It's all empty anyway, so everything is dukkha. So I'll just push it all away. You know, that's the thing. That's the thing about compulsive cycle of samsara. When we try to push them away, when we, need, when we try to push karmic effects away, they have a habit of 
coming back again, like a, like a boomerang. Because the causes are still there. Similarly, our approach, <clears throat> our approach to this can be, you know, trying to run away, but we just end up coming back right where we started. The end of compulsion, the uprooting of suffering is here and now. So we stop running. We stop looking outside and we really look. This isn't ignoring or, you know, pushing away anything. But it's about, it, it's recognizing. Recognizing that everything we experience is experienced in the mind. They appear to the mind, but if what appears, appears as solid and permanent when it's not, well, then we have work to do on the inside. So here, we're directed to target the, the cognitive uh, dissonance that antagonizes all the different afflictive emotions that uh, in turn causes us to act out unskillfully. The, root, uh, the three root afflictions are described and uh, then examples of many different negative emotional tones that spring from them. They're often called the three poisons too, the three poisons, because, because how detrimental they are to, to well-being and enlightenment. And it's important to remember this because on the evident evident level, we recognize how anger, how jealousy, and so on would lead us to act unskillfully towards others and therefore uh, bring pain to them. But being deeply conscientious of karma means that we recognize how negative um, emotions and karma cause suffering in samsara first and foremost to ourselves. So yes, here uh, Jelama Thamba describes the negative emotions and karma as kindling wood, kindling wood for the fire of suffering that hurts us. But as a Mahayana practitioner, as Mahayana practitioners, determined to heal this dynamic for all sentient beings without exception once and for all. We can't just, you know, replace negative emotions and karma with positive ones if that's still in samsara. The higher, the higher, happier levels follow the positive kind, but that's still in the wheel of life and impermanent and conditioned. So it cannot fulfill the two purposes long-term. Of course, we want to invest fully in positive body, speech, and mind to, um, you know, to bring good uh, results individually uh, and collectively, but, you know, for for liberation, for liberation, for permanent, unconditioned peace, unconditioned happiness, we need to break that chain, the chain by targeting the root of the problem. So next it says, although I want comfort for myself, I am overwhelmed by misknowing, so I exert myself. In the cause of intolerable suffering, and so for ages, the causes for gaining comfort, which are the opportunities for virtue, are ruined too. So, due to the root misknowing of the way things are, the afflictive emotions causes us to act out unskillfully. As practitioners, it's not that we want to, 
but we don't catch ourselves doing it. We neglect, we forget, we forget to integrate mindfulness uh, or our insight haven't yet um, you know, penetrated deeply enough in our mind. So when that happens, although it's, it is physical, verbal, and mental virtue that causes us um, the comfort we want, we end up jeopardizing it. And not only that, in order to have the opportunity to do good, you know, be comfortable and practice the Dharma, practice the Dharma in the future, it is also virtue, virtue that is the key. Right now, at this time, we have, um, we have the perfect opportunity to do good. We're comfortable, we can practice the Dharma in whatever way we want, so it's vital, it's vital that we make virtue key. But not just for a future in samsara, that's still ultimately unsatisfactory. So to use our perfect opportunity here and now for temporal and ultimate happiness, we need to, uh, we need to conjoin merit and wisdom, which means um, a total commitment to virtue is the basis for our study, uh, contemplation, and meditation to overcome this root, this uh, overcome uh, misknowing. So, when we awaken wisdom, we don't, we don't need to act like, you know, we're allergic to experiences that, um, you know, that foster afflictions or feel guilt-stricken for, you know, eating chocolates or getting annoyed when the Wi-Fi is not working or something. No, because we understand their true nature. But provisionally, sure, we apply restraint to, uh, to prevent escalation of afflictions uh, and negative karma, uh, which is what we call skillful means. Ultimately, however, yes, it is only for our own wisdom that can set us free from all karma and suffering. So we must, um, uh, you know, unite provisional methods and ultimate wisdom. But now, this is in no way for, you know, just for our own benefit when we apply this to the context of the Mahayana path. Um, well, as it, you know, as it goes on to say, compelled by many different desires, I hurt my parents and the rest of my loved ones, as well as my friends, and spoil my own bliss with even those who have been reliable friends for a long time for an insignificant reason and no real cause i think it's okay to be a little bit angry so this encourages us this encourages us to see how we need vigilance uh, you know vigilance with our feelings you know with our and intentions and with the potential actions coming from them uh, in terms of how others are affected too, you know, uh, starting with our family and friends. And it's all too easy, it's all too easy to complain that our situation isn't supportive enough. Like, you know, I try practicing patience with him, but he just doesn't listen. Or, you know, if I don't raise my voice, she doesn't take me seriously. Or, if they would meditate more, maybe they just, you know, they wouldn't be so annoying. You know, all of those things. But we're not expecting samsara to make it easy to practice compassion. 
to practice patience and all and so on. We practice with what we have got and don't try to, to, um, to use outer conditions to justify uh, any afflictions that arise. Uh, rather, we transform any adversity to our advantage through our commitment to train the mind for the two purposes. Um, this comes back to the theme of being with, with what we are feeling, uh, not stuck in. And therefore, you know, empowering our ability to respond rather than react. And this is a practice. So, of course, you know, we're going to make mistakes sometimes. It's a way of being that we have to familiarize ourselves with uh, through practice. So, not just in, as an intellectual ideal, but through a direct intuitive wisdom that we can gain from uh, meditating. So, and not just formal meditation sessions, but integrated mindfulness uh, in our daily life too, you know, such as, um, such as through our interaction. So yeah, the different, the different desires mentioned here uh, that compel us doesn't mean just you know selfish desires uh, for uh, you know getting our own way and feeling gratified the buddha taught that there's desires that relate to the senses just as wanting to see hear taste favorable things and in turn we want to avoid the unpleasant, the unpleasant experiences through the senses. But when we talk about the sixth sense in Buddha Dharma, which is mental consciousness, then the Buddha talked about, he talked about us wanting to be someone, somehow, you know, or um, wanting, wanting to not be in a kind of escapist or you know um, or nihilist way so the other two desires wanting in wanting an idealized identity or to not have to be conscious at all to avoid uh, you know painful impingement you know they can be subtle but they can just you know they can be just as dominating as you know of our um, you know, of our conditioning. And all the different forms of desire that condition our experiences influence how we act. So, without training our minds in wisdom and compassion, we could do, say, think reckless things. Things, even to those that we care, that we care about, due to this um, you know, conditioning process. So this is why we need an integrated approach of learning, um, you know, contemplative exercises, meditative uh, experiences to gain insight and free ourselves from this conditioning. Um, as we have pointed out that um, here that this isn't just to ease the stress that can come uh, our way right now, but for total freedom from the conditioning for suffering in samsara. Which is why we consider the things that, you know, that would usually antagonize afflictions, um, insignificant reasons, when we have the, you know, the broader spiritual perspective. And so on. In, in short, making the unho unwholesome state escalate, the compulsive beings of samsara do not rely on the holy dharma. So never have the chance for bliss. Again, this applies to this and every lifetime 
and all those who haven't yet sought the way to liberation and enlightenment. And since we're focused on the two purposes, we cannot be free while sentient beings who have been our mothers, our loved ones in previous lives are still suffering. So we need to utilize the Dharma to create the chance for lasting peace, lasting happiness for everyone. And then, and then that leads to the topic of bodhicitta. So uh, I think we will pause there and uh, we can continue exploring the sacred letter, the, this letter um, in the next video. Uh, until then, everybody stay safe, uh, stay well and keep flourishing in the Dharma. Thank you.